Germany's most famous jazz critic, Theodor Adorno, once called anti-Semitism the rumor about the Jew. And this is YouTube, so I'm here to talk about rumors. Cheers. Welcome back, everybody, to a video that's a bit different. Um, that is one that I've been talking about for a long time, a video about anti-Semitic stereotypes and narratives in fantasy and science fiction literature. And um, I'll try to explain what I'm doing here before we actually get started, so this um, will be a bit longer before we get into the meat of the video. Um, first of all, technical stuff. I'll record this in several parts because it's a very serious topic, it's a complicated topic, I want to get it right, and that means I have to take breaks, um, do research, well, I've done a lot of research already, but, you know, if I get something wrong, I don't want to re-record the entire thing again because, you know, editing is not my strong suit. That being said, I'm just sorry that there's cuts between certain segments, but I guess you can handle that. I hope so. All right, let's move on with all these things. Part two um, of the introduction. <laughs> Antisemitism and terminology and stuff. See, let's, let's start with something that will come up later on in this video, and that is the difference between antisemitism, Jew hatred, and anti-Judaism. There's, you know, a lot of terminology in here that I think makes sense to distinguish. Antisemitism is a specific term that came up in the 19th century, um, was used by, well, antisemites to self-describe themselves, um, around 1879-ish, 70-ish, and we'll get there during the video. So anything before that is technically not anti-Semitism. So we have two other things here. One of them is just hatred of Jews, Jew hatred, and the other thing is anti-Judaism. The difference here is that anti-Judaism is religiously motivated and views well, Judaism, the religion, which is different from, you know, racist or other stereotypes and prejudices that are also around for a long time, as we will see. So, there we are. I'll call something anti-Semitic stereotype when it's something that is still in, well, 19th and 20th century anti-Semitism. Like, certain narratives have made it all the way from the very, very dim past to, well, the present, basically. So that, that's out of the way. Next thing. Anti-Semitic stereotypes and anti-Semites. See, I'll, I'll be going through history and show where specific stereotypes and narratives came from, showed up for the first time, and so forth. I'll be giving some context and so forth. And I'll give examples from books, from fantasy and science fiction books. That's the goal of this video, right? Um, but I will not call, and I think this is important to ram home as much as I can, I am not calling any of the authors whose books I am talking about here as examples anti-Semites. I want to make this very clear because the term anti-Semite has a lot of political weight behind it. Calling someone an anti-Semite is very much ostracizing them from a lot of discourse, and rightly so. I, I fully subscribe that. The problem, however, is that because a lot of these stereotypes and narratives are so deeply embedded and ingrained in Western culture, people are subconsciously using them, not, you know, by purpose, on purpose, and that's, that's what I'm going to look at here. So I am not calling any of these authors anti-Semites. I don't think they put these things in there on purpose to pervade, you know, anti-Semitic stereotypes with some possible exceptions when I'll, you know, mark those. The next part is, I did choose some well-known authors here, and I have talked about some of their books before, and some of those I have had a lot of criticisms of. My point is, I'm not picking on these specific books, because I already hate them. I'm picking those because they are extremely well-known, they're big names. And I feel, for my, for my project here, it will be more helpful to talk about a book that you have probably or possibly read, or at least an idea of what it is, um, than me drawing on some self-published fiction that maybe 50 people have read. That will not actually help. But my goal is to showcase both anti-Semitic stereotypes and narratives, and how they show up in worlds that, on 
<laughs> on paper, don't have Jews necessarily. Um, and so you can recognize them in other fantasy and science fiction books. That's the goal here, to make clear where, what they are, where they are, where they are coming from, and how they may show up in places you're not expecting them, so we can avoid them in the future. And uh, last but not least, I will be talking about theology, of course, and history. I have no degree in neither Jewish philosophy or Christian theology or Judas religion. I am not an expert on theology. I'm also not someone with a history degree. I have studied several semesters of history focusing on ancient and medieval history, so that will certainly help me here. And I've done a lot of research. I will link well, I'll put a list of books that I have read down below on the history of antisemitism, on definitions of antisemitism, and so forth. If you want to do your own research, if you want to see what I've read, um, if you want to, you know, just get a broader picture. I have read all the books that I'll put down there below, and I can vouch for them being, well, helpful at least. <laughs> if you have further readings that or questions, or, well, hints and stuff, criticism, please let me know in the comments. I would like to, you know, further this discussion. If you think you know someone who should probably maybe watch this video, well, share, share it with them. And one final thing, I will not, and I'll say this very specifically, not tolerate any anti-Semitic stuff in those comments. I will police them and I will report anything anti-Semitic as hate speech. So, Please behave. And with all of that said, let's start by explaining why I want to do this and then get started. All right, why? All right, I think there's a long-ish story here, sort of. And that is that I have grown up in, well, in, in Germany and we have a bit of a history with anti-Semitism, you might say. Um, and in the way we talk about it after the Holocaust, after the National Socialist episode um, in our history, uh, means there's probably, hopefully, a bit more awareness of anti-Semitism in German discourse than in some other discourse or some other countries' discourse. So it's something that I'm maybe more aware of. I also studied, as I said, history and philosophy and stuff like that. So there's more awareness of that in my case. And over the years, when reading fantasy and science fiction and, you know, other books that fall under different headings, I've certainly encountered certain narratives, certain stories and elements and stuff again and again that sort of rang those alarm bells. And a lot of times I'm like, yeah, well, I guess it's, you know, sign of the times, maybe not. It's maybe something someone put in there subconsciously and so forth. And sometimes in discourse, over the last two years, when I talked about books here on the internet, I've mentioned those things, and oftentimes I've encountered ignorance. Um, mostly goodwilled ignorance, where people are like, I, I don't see this. And a lot of times that may just be because people are not aware of these certain narratives and stereotypes that have been around for so long that we have accepted a lot of those. <clears throat> and... Um, after a while, I said, like, maybe maybe someone needs to actually talk about this, because while you can find a lot of stuff about anti-Semitism, there is probably something out there that I would call, we, we have a very specific image, the same kind of image we have when we use the word Nazi. That is, we, we're all very clear what, like, extreme anti-Semitism is. But all these small bits and pieces that make up anti-Semitism, that end up being the thing that we imagine when we hear the word, those are often, you know, fly under the radar. And that's what I want to look at here. It's like, go through history from pre-Christian Mediterranean Europe and, well, North Africa, I guess, um, all the way to the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, and look at all the points where very important anti-Semitic narratives and stereotypes showed up and give a bit of context of, like, historical context where they came from, which is, I have to make this very clear, this is an explanation. This is not an excuse. None of these 
stereotypes are true. None of these can be condoned in any way. I'll just give some context of the society in which those things showed up. And this is once again very important. These narratives, these stereotypes have real world consequences. They lead to violence. They lead to suffering. And we should probably avoid that with our fiction. So that's, that's the mission statement. I'll go through it chronologically and uh, we'll see how far we can get with this. Pre-Christian hatred of Jews. Let's start with that. Now, I'm going to look at three elements here. Um, those are from, like, the Hellenistic era up to, early, you know, early imperial times, second, third, fourth century, um, or fifth century, actually. Um, sort of, um, well, we'll make a break in the middle, but early pre-Christian Mediterranean um, hatred of Jews. And those will be specific to Alexandria, then the further, like, wider Hellenistic era, and then Roman anti-Semitism. Well, I can't call it anti-Semitism, but Roman hatred of Jews and anti-Judaism. And then we'll, you know, move on to the next thing. All right, let's start with Alexandria. Alexandria is probably the um, best way to start. See, one of the oldest stories that we all remember, if we brought up Christian or, like, in a Christ Christian or Jewish context is what was later, well, turned into the book of Exodus. That is, Jews fleeing Israel for whatever reasons. And, well, <clears throat> there's two versions of that. There is the one that we know from the book of Exodus, um, but there's also another version um, that was written by a Egyptian priest in third, in third century before the Common Era in Alexandria. Alexandria is a huge city at the time. Alexandria is um, what you might call multi-ethnic, multicultural. It's, it's a huge metropolis at the time with all kinds of different people living there. And just like, you know, in all of these situations where you have all kinds of different cultures, ethnicities, squashed together in a small place, vying for control, vying for all kinds of things, and you get all kinds of ethnic and whatnot tensions. And that's that's the situation in which our man Manito, Manito um, writes his account of the Jews being kicked out of Israel, out of Egypt. They're not fleeing uh, the wrath of Pharaoh. They're actually getting kicked out because, according to Manito, they are, well, poor and diseased and spreading disease and they're dirty. Now, I'm not going to argue about all of these things here. The point is that the association of Jews as spreaders of disease and as, well, poor people and as dirty and as homeless, because obviously they're not Egyptian at the time, that's something that will come up later again and again. And there's other people in Alexandria at the time, all the way up to, say, the first um, century Common Era, that right also about the Jews, and they hate the Jews. And there's another story that they tell that is specifically from that time. And that is a story of cannibalism. There is a story, um, once again, this is all false, <clears throat> that Jews capture a Greek at the time, and they fatten that person, and at some point they ritually slaughter that person and eat parts of it. We'll put a pin into that again, the idea of ritual murder and cannibalism is something that will come up later. Once again, this is definitely all not true. This is born out of a conflict between a significant Jewish population of Alexandria, an older Egyptian population in Alexandria, all kinds of other ethnicities that are certainly, you know, fighting for control. There's rivalries. There's a lot of tension in that city. So that's, that's the background, but these stories show up. And it's important to understand that cannibalism is just about the vilest accusation that you can make in the ancient world, in the pre-Christian world, in the Hellenistic world. It's a sign that people are not fully human, that a group of humans is closer to animals. It's, it's that kind of thing. It shows up outside of just Jews. There's a lot of people that get accused of being cannibals at the time. 
So, but it gets leveled against the Jews. And we kind of know these sort of things. And well, I'll mention him here. I'll mention him later again um, through Flavius Josephus, who is a Jewish Roman historian um, who wrote a book called The Jewish War, which you can read. It's classic um, antique um, historiography about something later that we'll talk about, well, the Jewish um, war against the Romans and the destruction of the temple, but we'll get there. See, the point is, he wrote a lot about, well, Jewish history in that regard, so we have a lot of these sources here uh, from Alexandria. The next part is <clears throat> the Hellenistic era in general. What we learn here is a few other things that add to, well, negative stereotypes about Jews. One of them is that they have not contributed to humanity. And this is an important aspect that will come up later again. They are, well, they're taking stuff, but they're not creating. They have not have any, had any great inventors, other great men. That's, that's another um, thing that is claimed about the Jews. That's obviously wrong. Um, we don't need to talk about that here, but it is mentioned at the time. And the third one is that they are atheists. Now, that claim needs to be qualified in a lot of ways because obviously they are not atheists. See, the, the problem here is that we're talking about a world with a lot of different religions, and while not necessarily everyone worships every god, there's a general acceptance that these other gods exist, and that you can worship them if you feel like it. Now, that's a bit hard to square with a lot of uh, Judaism. Yes, there are sources, you know, parts of the Old Testament where it's very clear that um, there was, well, the acceptance that other gods exist, it's just forbidden to worship them. So a group of people that denies worship to any other god is seen as almost atheist at the time. The same thing, and that's one that will come up later when we talk about Rome as well, um, is the dietary laws. Now, a lot of, a lot of different ethnicities at the time had different dietary laws. Um, what is allowed to eat and what is not allowed to eat. That's not the necessary, not a general problem, but what is seen as a problem by some of those Greek authors at the time is that Jews um, did not allow Gentiles to partake in food with them, in meals with them, or did not join other people in meals with them. <clears throat> and that that is a key issue at the time because that separates the Jewish ethnicity from other people. And in a time, both the Hellenistic and then later Roman time, society is very much defined through these social acts, things that you do together, worshipping together, pouring libations together, communal eat, eating. Those things make society. So someone or a group of people not partaking in that is seen as different, as other and that is an important thing to be considered later, because for a lot of the things that happen over time, it is important to see all of Jews as the other, as very different. And it kind of starts there in that area. So these are, well, Alexandrine and then Hellenistic stereotypes or narratives about Jews. What about Rome? Well, Rome is a bit interesting there as well. See, the Romans, well, they obviously conquered um, uh, the countries in, where the, in which Jews lived, and there was a sizable Jewish population in Rome itself, and they are thus sort of accepted as people from the empire. And we need to talk about the fact that this is an empire, and there's, there will be interesting aspects to that. <clears throat> and the Jewish religion is accepted in Rome. That means they are allowed to worship in Rome in synagogue. And that's, that's, that's a big thing. The Romans even accepted that Jews could not be coerced to take part in the Roman state religion, which is, you know, worshipping the emperor and stuff like that. It did, however, definitely raise suspicions in a lot of ways. And this is, this is sort of what the Roman era can add. Now, some of those uh, stereotypes that we've talked about before from the Hellenistic era are just, like, taken over, you know, Jews being seen as poor, Jews being seen as dirty, <clears throat> those kind of things just show up from time to time. But there's a new thing 
and that is citizenship and loyalty. See, the Roman Empire has a lot of people from all kinds of ethnicities, so they start actually thinking about something like citizenship, with, you know, moving on, more and more people are given the right of Roman citizens. But with that comes a lot of stuff like duties and rights and, uh, but most importantly, duties and loyalties. <clears throat> and that's something that the, the apartness of Jews <clears throat> is in conflict with. And we see something here that comes up later again, and that's why I'm bringing it up. And that's the fear that Jews are maybe not as loyal to the Roman Empire and to the Roman Emperor as other Romans. Well, they're obviously not worshipping the emperor as God. They're not partaking in that thing. They're also, as I mentioned, not partaking in these communal rituals of um, food sharing, eating, drinking, pouring libations, worshipping together. So they, they're holding themselves apart, but they are also part of the empire. So there is that twin loyalty and that doubt of like, if push sho comes to shove, which way will they jump? To whom are they actually loyal? And that's a question that will come up again and again. That's why I mention it as a specifically Roman addition to the picture of Jews in the West and how a lot of people looked at them and treated them. And that fear that there might be something there. There is also the fear that Jews, because... As a group, they have a like higher group cohesion. Jews talk to other Jews all over the empire. They have been spread at that time, uh, at that point, um, that they might actually, you know, do things um, against the empire. On the other hand, this is not specific to Jews at the time. Romans, like actual Romans, Romans, were also fearful of all kinds of other groups from the provinces that they may do the same thing. But it, it shows up here. However, as I said, the main thing that I feel Roman anti-Semitism, well, anti, well, Jew hatred actually, adds is the idea that Jews may not be loyal to the state because they are also loyal to some internal Jewish idea. And that's, that's all we probably need to know about pre-Christian Mediterranean hatred of Jews and certain stereotypes and narratives. We have some of the key ones, right? We have the dirt, the spreading of disease from Alexandria. We have the holding themselves apart, and we have the not contributing to humanity part from the greater Hellenistic discourse. And we have the twin loyalties, once again, combined with the idea of um, separateness from the rest um, in a, well, identity, citizen identity that goes beyond mere ethnicity in the Roman Empire. So, what's going to happen next? Part 2. Time to address the Christ-shaped elephant in the room. Cheers. Well, while we talked about Jews as an ethnicity and a religion at the same time when we talked about the... Um, anti judaist and mostly, um, well, you might call them racist, although technically this is not yet a race, um, stereotypes and hatreds against Jews in a pre-Christian era, it is now time to face up to the fact that, well, most of Western history has been impacted by Christianity. And, well, so has um, the hatred for Jews in a lot of ways. And we've entered now the territory of anti-Judaism. That means a religious hatred and prejudices against the Jews. So let's go back and talk a bit about early Christianity, one of my favorite topics and um, one full of fun and games. See, as I mentioned before, um, during the Roman Empire time that we're talking about, like late Roman Republic and then, well, the actual Re Empire, um, the identification of faith or religion with tribal or ethnic identity, <clears throat> that identity is breaking up. Suddenly people are adopting religions, um, gods um, from different tribes. Um, certain Egyptian deities are very popular in Rome, and so are, is apparently Judaism. We've 
talked about that, and we'll get there in a moment again. That means that Rome has Roman citizens that go to synagogue to worship. They are, for reasons that I will not explain because I am not a Roman citizen, <laughs> attracted to um, monotheism in that regard, and that specific brand of monotheism that we um, find in Judaism. But what is Judaism around that time? That's, that's the important question that we need to talk about here. See, what we talk about here is late Second Temple Judaism. Or, as some scholars say, late Temple, late Second Temple Judaisms. Because at the time, the Roman Empire has conquered and made Palestine a, prophet, a province, or is about to do so, even though it has its local king, King Herod the Great, um, who built a fantastic amphitheater in Caesarea. If you ever go to Israel, I urge you to visit that part. It's fantastic. Yes, I've been there. Um, anyway, my point is um, that um, there is a lot of unrest in um, Judaism, in the Jewish well, society at the time, and there is what you might call a sense of millenarianism. Um, what that means um, is, well, a sense of a an upcoming end of the world or a change in time, a, well, a great change, so to speak. And, well, Jewish religion is fairly diverse at the time. There is the Great Temple in Jerusalem, the Second Temple, obviously, um, that is sort of the center of everything, and everyone congregates there on Passover to celebrate and so forth. But apart from that, there's all kinds of different groups, sects, and so forth that believe very diverse things. And in that era, one Jesus of Nazareth is just another Jewish preacher at the time. Maybe a bit more radicalism than some others, but definitely not beyond what Judaism at the time encompasses. So, so far, a lot of things are fairly vague, and that's that's the big thing that we need to accept when we're talking about um, early Christianity. That narrative that we have, Judaism, Jesus gets born, crucified, wakes up again, spoiler here, um, and then we have Christianity. That's, that's not exactly how it works, and that's what I'm trying to get across here. This is a 400-year kind of thing that we're talking about. So let's um, continue that. Well, uh, we all kind of know the story. On a certain Passover, Jesus and his gang of um, more radicalized, um, end-of-the-world kind of preacher, preaching people show up in... Jerusalem. As far as we know, and there's, well, there's a bunch of sources here, one of them being um, aforementioned jo <laughs> Flavius Josephus, which, yeah, once again, go read that book. It's actually really good. Um, well, what we know is that there is some sort of disturbance because um, anti-capitalist Jesus walks into the temple and makes a bit of a, well, ruckus, I guess. Well, you know, something I totally support um, in theory and so forth, but there is an issue. Because, as I already mentioned, Jews are not really happy under what you might call Roman rule at the time. And Romans are aware of that. And Passover, with all these different um, religious sects all coming together to the temple, to that one thing that unites them all in their worship, um, riots are something that happens a lot around that time. So the Romans are kind of trigger-happy in a lot of ways. And once that thing at the temple happens... Um, they snatch Jesus and make an example of him to make sure that there's no bigger riot at actual Passover. That's that's sort of what you might look at from a more Roman perspective here. And um, that's uh, how it goes. And the people that follow Jesus um, start their own thing. Now, will there be, is there a, you know, resurrection and all that? I, um, well, I doubt it. But that doesn't really matter. See, the group that follows these specific teachings, that one specific sect of Judaism, continues with the story of the resurrection, which fits nicely into that whole idea of the end of the world or a new age beginning. Um, and, well, Jewish teaching at the time, and they just, you know, just start calling Jesus um, Messiah. And, well, Christ, which is the same thing, just in, you know, a different language. So... We're still sort of, and this is the interesting part, almost within the bounds of second, late Second Temple Judaism, 
They're not yet outside of that. And that's the great story that we need to understand for the next, you know, century, roughly century and a bit, which is a very interesting time in so many ways. See, um, at the beginning, we have a lot of overlap between all kinds of people that are attracted to Judaism in its varied forms. We have uh, those Roman citizens, those proselytes that um, are getting closer to you know, um, Judaism, and sometimes worship at synagogue. And depending on which synagogue they're going to, they might get taught very different aspects of Judaism and Judaism beliefs. And some of those suddenly become more Christian in a way, or like also include the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth and start calling him Christ sort of over time. And there's a lot of, you know, communication between, between these different aspects of uh, Judaism, and for the time being, everyone still kind of congregates every year for Passover, which is still a holiday in those Jesus-infected um, parts of Judaism, so to speak. And that's that's all. It kind of works. There's discourse and there's disputation about who is who and so forth, and the Romans get involved because at some point, and we'll, we'll keep that going, at some point there is uh, the question of who is a Jew and who is not, because there is a specific tax leveled against Jews, which is one of those points where, like, some people want to decide they are Jews and some people want to decide they're not Jews. Before that, Jews had a certain, you know, privileges within Roman, uh, the Roman Empire, for example. They were not forced to actually worship the god, well, the divine personage of the emperor. As you all know, emperors are um, divine in Rome. Well, they, they get divine when they die, which is an apotheosis. Um, nice word, right? Anyway, so <laughs> there are privileges to being Jewish. So everyone claims to be Jewish before the point when suddenly being Jewish costs money. So the question is like, who's Jewish and who's not? And the question is like, who do you ask? Well, I guess you ask in your local synagogue. And that means that suddenly we have two, like we have a huge cloud of different interpretations of the same religion and they need to define who's in and who's out. What kind of stuff is allowed and what kind of stuff is not allowed. And one of the things that you kind of settle on fairly early is circumcision. Now, circumcision has been around for a while. Jews have practiced it for a long time. In fact, even in like pre-Christian times, you sometimes hear mention of that specific fact as one of the odd cup out practices of the of the Jews. But now it becomes one of the defining things, because while people may go to synagogue and people may, you know, worship that God and so forth, uh, the God of the Jews, Jawe, or however you want to pronounce the name, right? Which you shouldn't. Um, <laughs> circumcision is seen, begins to be seen as the final step to conversion to full-on Judaism in a lot of ways. And on the other hand, Christian the more Christian or Christ-following parts of Judaism start accepting people in their group even when they're not circumcised. So we begin, we see how these things kind of begin to move apart. Um, we also have other questions like, what about the Torah? What about the old books? What about um, what we in Christianity now call, or what Christians begin to call, because I'm not exactly very Christian, right? What what people in Christianity now call the Old Testament. What about those rules? The Ten Commandments? Is that stuff still, you know, on the books? What about all those wonderful rules about stoning oxen in, in Leviticus? Is that still, you know, on the books? Who knows? Who cares? And the interesting question is when you read the Gospels, which, yeah, you should probably do once in your life, they're inconsistent on that. And that's one of those signs that we have that different, different communities in different parts at different times had different views on that. It's, it's why uh, St. Paul is writing all these angry letters to all kinds of Jewish, Jewish Christian um, God-fearing um, communities all over the place, yelling at them on what makes or makes not a Christian part of the Jewish community. And that's that. That's all part of that. So that's one big step. How we have this huge model of religion that is slowly um, moving apart from the ethnic aspect of the tribe of Jews um, or the ethnic ethnicity of Jews, and that's that's one important step. The other important step is once again 
War. See, I already mentioned that there is a lot of, you know, unrest in Palestine, and that all comes to a head with what, once again, Flavius Josephus um, calls the Jewish War. Um, it's quite the kerfuffle, to put it mildly. A lot of people die. The second temple gets destroyed, which is the most important aspect here. And also there is um, the whole thing at Masada, which I hope you've heard of. There's a lot of heroism being done there. It's all very tragic, and it has been important for Jewish and now Israeli identity in a lot of ways. By which I mean, a bunch of people were besieged in the castle of Masada and um, committed mass suicide to not give up to the Romans. Yeah, you can see why that one is a bit of a big symbol, and we can discuss the concept of mass suicide there, because technically it wasn't because, well, they killed each other until the last person killed themselves, but you know, there we go. The legend is there. That's the first of the Jewish uprisings. There's two more, um, but that's the key one for us to talk about here. Because, and, and once again, Flavius Josephus is your source there, because he was very close to the action around that time. He was, well, part of that stuff. So unlike, say, um, some of the Greek and classic historians that we have from antiquity, that guy probably knew what he was talking about. He has, um, as a Roman Jewish citizen, obviously an agenda there, but, you know. So, go read that book. Well, there's, there's a bunch of consequences here that will, you know, speed up the diversion between, or um, divergence between Christianity, or what becomes Christianity, and Judaism. Uh, one of them is that, well, Suddenly, um, Jews have to pay those taxes. Also, suddenly, with that rebellion being crushed, um, some groups that are not took not part did not take part in the rebellion, as possibly, probably, most of the more Christianized parts of uh, the vast, you know, slightly Jew Judaistic um, group of religious beliefs around that area. Um, well. They have a good reason to distance themselves from from all the things that happened around there. <clears throat> now you can argue why they did not take part in that rebellion. Part of that is probably because they obviously believe that the new time has already come, Messiah has arrived, so there's no need to actually force that big change and end of the world that these kind of rebellions usually are and by you know combined with. But the point is, after that, they have a good reason to pretend that they are not actually Jews. Before that, it was more like, hey, we're Jews, we just believe all these other things as well. Now they're like, no, 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 we're certainly not Jews, not like those people over there. Um, so we don't have to pay the uh, additional Jew tax, and also, um, please don't hurt us for, you know, um, rebelling and stuff. And that's, that's exactly what happens. So the divergence spreads further apart. Also, you know, Christians, or people that were called Christians, even though they're mostly different things, had already been persecuted in Rome by emperors like Nero, so we have that thing going on as well. So they're sort of trying to no longer be the smallest kid on the block that gets bullied by everyone else, and that lost rebellion in Palestine is certainly helping them to do that. So once again, we have a we have a further reason to um, for for the Christian part here to you know distance themselves from Judaism. But on the other hand, we also have something happening in Judaism that is very important here. See, I mentioned the temple got destroyed, which is hugely important. Because, as I mentioned before, the temple in Jerusalem was the one thing that all these various sects of Judaism at the time had in common. Going there on Passover to celebrate Passover together is the one thing that held it all together. The people in charge of the temple are the one sort of religious authority that people still accepted. And... Um, the temple's gone, so what's defining Judaism now? The, the center cannot hold, as someone said, but the center is gone now. So there is something that happens, which is, well, teachers of Judaism start writing down things and start, you know, defining 
codifying the tenets of um, Judaist beliefs, of um, Jewish beliefs. That's the beginning of what you might call the rabbinic era of Judaism. Rabbis are starting to codify the whole thing. So they also have an, you know, a lot of uh, reasons to want to distance themselves from those other guys that didn't help us in the rebellion. All these other things are not are believing stuff that is actually far beyond all the stuff that we that good Jews should be that believe and so forth. That's what happens there. So we have now we have both sides of that divide find reasons to further that separation and codify it by writing down stuff. The Christians meet for synods and write down their beliefs over time, and the Jews um, do the same thing. So we, we can now start to talk of Christianity on the one hand, very early Christianity that is still very much trying to figure out what's what, <laughs> on the one hand, and Judaism on the other hand, also defining itself and finding a more like mainstream, I don't want to call it orthodoxy because of all the associated terms, but that, that's what's happening. And we're almost done. There's just two more things we need to talk about here. See, all of that continues, but at the same time, Jews are still highly respected in the Roman Empire in a lot of other ways. They are spread all over the place. After those Jewish rebellions, they are spread even further. It's your good old diaspora. So they are everywhere, but we'll get back to the diaspora later on. But Jews have rights. Synagogues are protected. All of these things. Christians don't yet have those rights until good old Constantine. See, Emperor Constantine famously first accepted the Christian religion as, like, you know, an official religion that is, you know, sanctioned within the Roman Empire, and on his deathbed, apparently accepted Christian religion. Now, we're not going to go into legends about, like, visions and in hoc signo vinces and all of that stuff. Point is, Christian Christianity is beginning to be on the up and up. And that's pretty good. Well, obviously, after that, we have the interlude of the most fun Roman emperor, if not the one that dies the most fun death, which would be Caracalla. But Julian the Apostate, fun guy, fun guy who is really not a fan of Christianity and uh, wants to bring back the old gods, doesn't really go. He also hates the Jews, though, so th there's that. Julian hates monotheism in general, is what I'm trying to say. And then comes uh, Theodosius, um, and Theodosius makes Christianity the official state religion in the Roman Empire. Now, why is that important? See, that flips... That flips on the worldly stage. It flips uh, the hierarchy between Judaism and Christianity. Suddenly, Christianity is the big boy around, and um, <clears throat> Judaism is no longer that big of a religion. The hierarchy has shifted. That means there's going to be attacks on Jews. Uh, Jews are still protected at the time, but the Christians are the big boys now. And that reflects in a very important aspect of um, theology. One that we'll come back to um, again and again, and that is the idea of supersession. See, the question is, if the Jews are God's chosen people and there is the covenant, does that still hold? Are they still or not? And there's the idea in Christianity, I'm, I'm just repeating theology here, don't shoot me, that <laughs> um, Christianity and the new covenant of Jesus Christ with God and so forth, does supersede the Old Covenant. That's like a theology that you put there. And the argument there is, of course, well, you know, it's because the Jews killed Jesus Christ, which they didn't. It was definitely the Romans. But there is that idea, like through that whole enmity of being allowed to be part of Judaism or not allowed part of Judaism. Then you have the rebellions that get crushed. As I said, there's like three of them. And the Jews being spread all over the place. And people are like, see, that's what you get from not being with us cool kids over here without Jesus. Um, and by the way, now we are God's chosen ones and you're no longer. And that's sort of how the theory of supersession becomes popular and vindicated through actual politics. First Constantine and then Theodosius. 
So we have one of these key ideas that will come around again and again, um, that has stayed until the 20th century when the Catholic Church finally said like, nope, the Jews did not kill Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, it's one of those key stories that will come up again and again in all of anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. There's one final thing missing here that we will see at the end of, well, at the beginning of the 5th century. I said it's we're talking about five centuries today. And that is, um, after St. Paul, who did a lot of harm to Christianity, the second most impactful and harmful guy in Christian theology, St. Augustine of Hippo. <clears throat> now, I've seen hippos before, and they're a lot of things, <laughs> but they're not very smart. No, in all seriousness, St. Augustine is a hugely important Christian philosopher and theologian, um, also a bit of a playboy in his youth, and then Later on, he was witness uh, to, well, the sacking of Rome, and that made him kind of think about, like, hey, what's going on here? I better write a book. And he wrote one. It's called De Civitate Dei, or The City of God, in a very bad English translation. Anyway, it's his key text of uh, Christian theology, where he tries to square Christian theology with history and build up this whole huge thing of how everything fits together. Well, and he has to fit the Jews into the whole thing. And he comes up with something that is called the, uh, the theory of Jewish witness. He's like, well, the Jews have to stay around because they bear witness to the greatness of Christian belief and of, well, Christianity. They have to stay around, they have to suffer, but um, they should not, you know, be killed, just, you know, not treated too well. They have to stay around, so we all know that we're better than them. And God has actually given us his favor and no longer them who were, according to texts that we still believe in, um, his chosen people before. And he looks at history for that, and he then makes up this doctrine. and. If you've heard of the idea of the wandering Jew and bearing witness, that's exactly where it comes from. And um, it's done a lot of harm over the centuries, but I think it's important to keep that one in mind. The other part is, of course, that the Jews over time have to convert to Christianity. That's part of that whole thing. <clears throat> Before the end, there is obviously one guy that I didn't really mention because um, it's all crazy talk. But you may have heard of a book called um, The Revelation of John. Well, that book of Revelation does also mention Jews and that whole stuff and introduces a fun guy called the Antichrist. Um, we're not going into the theology there, but Revelation connects the Jews with the Antichrist. And um, that's something that will come up in our next segment, along with a lot of other fun things. Can you guess which? Part three, it's time to get medieval. All right, now we've come to one of the most difficult parts of this whole situation because we have to talk about the Middle Ages. And the first problem that we face here is the Middle Ages are huge and long and hard to define. And it really depends on where and when you are and so forth. That's our big problem. So I have to pick one specific point that I feel is the key in our ongoing examination here. Part two is, problem two is that um, the Middle Ages have had a huge impact or a, a specific image of the Middle Ages have had a huge impact on, say, fantasy literature and a lot of other things in our um, <clears throat> public image nowadays and that in public imagination nowadays. And that's why this is such a key period, um, both historically and for our end goal, which is to find out um, why there are such, um, well, anti-Semitic stereotypes in a lot of fantasy and science fiction literature. So, let's look at what we'll do here. In theory, the Middle Ages are basically a thousand years from roughly like 400 or 500 common era to 1500, depending on how and where you look. We're not going to look at all of these parts. The early Middle Ages, um, are basically in Western Europe what happens once the Western part of the Roman Empire falls. There's a bunch of individual kingdoms. Usually they are organized, and this is important, um, by tribes, by Germanic tribes that 
came and conquered those. So you have your Vandals that go all the way through Spain to Northern Africa. We have, you have your Visigoths that end up in Spain. You have your Ostrogoths that end up in Italy. You have your Lombards that end up in Northern Italy. You have your different Frankish tribes that end up in, well, France at the end of the day. And a lot more, right? And each of those kingdoms is basically organized by tribe. There's um, a lot of um, tribal identity. That's the key thing to start with. And that's all we'll talk about here. Jews are just, you know, they live there and there is certainly sometimes um, trouble here and there. But mostly things are still sort of sometimes looking at um, like traditions so Jews can just exist there. Once again, there is, of course, evidence of um, individual actions against Jews in all of these parts, but for now, that's not where things change or become different in a very specific way. But now we'll have to look at the important like two to three hundred years from around 1000 to around 1250, roughly that time. And there's a lot of things going on there, and I'll try to explain it in like two parts to um, show where this is going. Part one is we'll talk about the growth of the high, well, high middle, middle ages, basically. There's a lot of things happening in societal changes there, and then we'll talk about how those changes in a lot of ways affect... Um, Jews and um, have had a lasting impact all the way till today. All right, so what happens? See, um, there's a lot of things happening around, you know, the 11th, 12th century that have to do with changes in agriculture, a growth in population, wealth, and so forth. We've come up with, you know, three-field ag agriculture. There's more food produced, more people, you know, population growth, and so forth. And those obviously lead to changes in society in a lot of ways, and that's what we need to talk about here. So, on the um, worldly side of things, what happens is <clears throat> that we need to organize a society that produces more than it needs, that is actually growing. That society needs to be reorganized. The first part is, like, how do you deal with that um, stuff? See, once you have, you know, more products to sell, you need to actually figure out a system of economy. So that's the first huge change that happens around that time. During, well, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, in Western Europe, what you mostly have is a gift-based economy. If you read someone like Gregory of Tours, which you totally should because it's a lot of fun, or other sources from like the early Middle Ages, what you find is it's a gift-based economy. What that means is you exchange gifts. That is, when we exchange things, their value is not necessarily a monetary value, it's a symbolic value. It's a symbolic capital that we exchange. That's something that you find, for example, in ancient Greece, all the way until the Athenian Empire changes things there. That's sort of that idea. So the value of these gifts is symbolic. And as long as that symbolic value is more or less equal, a gift exchange works. That changes now, and we start to actually talk about a monetary economy. That means while there is not everything is based, is coin-based, currency-based at that point. Don't worry. There's a lot of barter going on. There's a lot of trade going on. But the value of goods exchanged is no longer a symbolic one. It's a monetary one. So the equivalent of, well, if, if someone trades, say, corn or other agricultural products with someone else, they may get, say, cloth in exchange. But an equivalent amount and that value is now you know, calculated in a different way. So we change to money. And that means that you have to write down debts, that you have to actually, you know, do calculations, even if no one ever sees a single coin. And that is one of the first big changes around that time. They switch to a monetary economy. And that leads to something that is important here. And that leads, well, to changes in society. Some people will profit from a monetary economy in a way that they didn't from a gift-based, symbolic um, capital-style economy. Other people will, well, you know, lose a lot of prestige, a lot of state status in their society. They will be, well, at the losing end of this change. 
And that obviously makes those people really not like money-based economy, monetary ex economy. Who can blame them? So that's a first part that we need to look at. <clears throat> the second part is, of course, the change in structure. See, as I already mentioned, the early Middle Ages were definitely organized on, along a tribal, family, community-based structure. That's, that's how you identify people and who they belong to and so forth. That changes around, well, the 11th, 12th and so forth century. And we come to something that is much closer to what we would call a state, that we would call a yeah, state roughly. Well, it's definitely mostly monarchy at that point, don't worry, but we have one centrally organized state, a kingdom with a king who lives in a capital, and all these people in all these different places belong to that structure, through that kingdom. The tribal identity is broken apart in that regard. That's a key thing that happens around that time. See, when you look at, like, you know, your earlier Middle, Age, Middle Ages, what you usually happens in those tribal kingdoms that a ruler moves about. They hold court wherever they are. To, they visit all these places. That's how they project power. That's how they make sure their kingdom runs, is by showing up in all these places, holding court, um, deciding cases, judging, doing all these things personally by running around in their kingdom and so forth. That changes now. We have a centrally organized kingdom now, a centrally organized duke, whatever you want to call it, realm. Let's call it a realm. And that is fairly close to how we nowadays still would think the term state. It's not a nation state per se, but there's a change here. And what comes with that is, once again, the question's like, who belongs to the state and who does not belong? Because identity is no longer, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm a Lombard, so I live in Lombardy. And suddenly, that's no longer how that works. And we'll see how that impacts a lot of things. So we have a centrally organized, restructured form of state, the realm. And that, that is um, the next big change. And once again, because these changes obviously um, come with winners and they come with losers. And we'll see what that will be. The next part. The rise in education. Around the year 1100, you know, during that time we have a rise of education or a rediscovery of education in a lot of cases. And that means we have the first Actual universities being founded in Bologna, sometimes later in Paris, in Sorbonne, at the Sorbonne, and other places. And in these places, people can learn and study. What they study is, for example, Roman law, or law in general, theology, philosophy. A lot of older texts are rediscovered at that time through all kinds of meaning means. We'll not go into that right now. Well, the means that we have a slow rise in literacy, we have a slow rise in education and knowledge in a lot of places, and, and this is key, universities are a secular thing. Yes, you study theology there, and they, have, they are partly controlled by the church, and they will certainly adhere to um, all these requirements of the Catholic Church, who does sort of um, extend or has a hegemony of meaning over the entirety of Western Europe at that time, but they are secular. You can study at a university without being a priest, even without aiming to become a priest. You don't have to join a monastery or so forth to actually learn at these places. That's the next huge thing. But it also means that, you know, clerics, like priests in the Catholic Church or thinkers in the Catholic Church start adhering more and more to the same principles that are taught at these universities. And those are partly the principles of philosophy, of argumentation that you learn from, say, Aristotle, Plato, Roman philosophers, and so forth. A rational argument and disputation become part of the theological argument at the time, of the, of the theological arsenal at the time. <clears throat> Why we also have well, a rise in a rise in a educated class, um, a secular educated class. So those are the three huge changes at the time. And now we'll look where all of that leads to change things in Europe forever. All right. So what happens? Part one, 
we'll see that with the rise of you know, a monetary economy and the change to a centrally organized um, structure of states, um, there is a need for people to actually organize that power, to run things under the king, to project the power of the final ruler of a specific um, realm into all these smaller places. And to do that, to run both the economy and, well, the state structure, you need people with a certain level of education. So where do, get you, where do you get those people? See, at the beginning, partly you get those, well, from already educated people outside of the church and monasteries. The one group that already had that kind of education were Jews. Because, well, Judaism is much more tied to education or to literacy in a way that um, being Catholic is not, or being a, being a Christian was not at the time. So, in a lot of cases, those were natural fits for all these roles. What that means is that there is an identification between Jews and money, especially, because those people are qualified to do it. They may not necessarily join uh, the first starting guilds, because guilds were organized by religion, so you have to be a Christian to join a guild of craftsmen and so forth. And, you know, and they can actually run the numbers. So, that's where that happens. They become tax gatherers. They become... Well, not yet bankers, but all of these things, the association with that new form of economy, that monetary economy, is there. And um, that's a first identification that will remain until today. In a negative way, because who loves tax gatherers, right? And once, once we actually come to the point that they become moneylenders, because the church not liking those changes in the structure that leads to a monetary economy, forbids Christians to lend money with interest. The famous term here is usury. Well, that means that suddenly Jews are people who can do that or have to do that. Once again, they're not allowed to join craftsmen's guilds, so they're pushed out of a lot of other avenues of actually livelihood. So they become the ones in charge of for trade, in charge of trade, in charge of banking, and money lending, and in charge of gathering taxes for other people. And uh, that makes them very unpopular and gives us that association between Jews and money that we have all the way until today. It's not exactly their choice, it's just that those are the avenues there. All right, the next bit is, of course, the secular power structure. We already said that, you know, with a centralized regime, so to speak, we have a lot of, you know, need for bureaucracy, administration to actually make sure stuff works, power is produced, is projected into the smallest part of the realm. And how do you do that? Well, you do that through law. Law is the one thing that you need to actually keep a country running. And there is a shift in law there as well, with the rediscovery or um, repopularization of Roman law. And those people starting to work and project the power of the centralized government, if you want to call it government, into the, into the entirety of the realm, those are people that start, you know, that learn how to do Roman law or what medieval scholars make of that. They are a new class in that regard. They are not based on property, on owning land or anything. They are actually the people working in the offices, the smaller cogs in the machine, which means they are dependent on their lords to actually keep them around. And how do you do that? <clears throat> well, by, by two things. You A, show that you're really busy, and you B, uh, create a threat or something that the law needs to be applied to. And yeah, that means threat. Of course, because, you know, if you run the law, you want your boss to know that you're A, super busy, and B, that, you, that they think they need you around because apparently there's a lot of miscreants around that you, the law, needs to struggle with. So that's one key thing happening here right now. So where does all of that go? See, at the same time, the Catholic Church becomes another monastery in a lot of ways, and also um, becomes a running system, a structure, a fixed, a more firm structure, a more formalized structure in a lot of ways, making sure that it is also run according to, well, the precepts of the, well, of, of faith, but also having an administration as well. Though the papal state, as they call it, obviously, is a state. And 
<clears throat> that means that there is an idea of like how do how does the church project its power on all these stronger, you know, more and more rising kings of France, Germany, and so forth. That's obviously through spiritual supremacy. That means all of West. Europe in that case is seen as the body of Christ, the body of the the body of the church. There is that overarching Christian identity, and that leads to a number of important elements here that we all tie together now. All right, let's start with what happens here is the body of Christ needs to be pure. There's an idea of purity here that comes back through law and all, the, all these other things. That means everyone has to be Christian according to what the church says, sort of. Those are mostly moral failings or anything like that, but they are picked up by that secular structure, the secular, secular judiciary in a way. Because they need to find all these people, that all the, create all these threats to the kingdom to make sure that their secular lords also keep them around to, you know, establish their power base, basically. And that leads to the persecution of a number of people that either the church or these secular clerks um, want to get rid of or identify as not part of the state. They're, they are the other and they are slowly dehumanized. And a lot of these people are, well, heretics. Um, they might be lepers with leprosy. They might be homosexual. They might be prostitutes. Or they might be Jews. Anyone who is not part of the healthy body of Christ and is thus, is thus to be, you know, expelled, expelled in a, well, there, there's a lot of medical terminology going on around that stuff. And that's what someone like um, R.I. Moore calls the formation of a persecuting society. These things are then, with the help of Roman law, formalized in a lot of ways, systematized, that persecution, that othering, that dehumanizing of groups that are not part of the state, of the church, and so forth. They are dehumanized in a way and systematically persecuted. Even if they, their threat is not very much, you know, not huge or even non-existent. Even if it's large, you know, it leads to the creation of an image that needs to be persecuted. There is a level of abstraction happening here. The, the leper, the Jew, the heretic. Like, on the ground, those people don't necessarily exist. I mean, obviously, there's people with um, heretical beliefs and there's people with leprosy and there's Jews. But we come to that creation of an abstract image, especially with the Jew, once, you know, leprosy obviously fades into the background and heresy is um, mostly defeated by the um, uh, creation of the um, Inquisition in the 13th century. So let's look at the, at the Jews in particular here. We have a bunch of individual acts of um, aggression against Jews all the time. One of them is the expulsion or attack of Jews by their lords, because if you ex expel all the Jews from your country, you as the lord take over all their stuff. And if they have, you know, or if you, you know, had debts with those Jews, well, those, <coughs> those debts are gone if you kick them out of your country. That's one very worldly um, thing going on there. Another part is a theoretical, a theological one. See, around that time, with the rise of philosophy again, we come to proofs of God's existence, of the Christian faith, rational proofs of the Christian faith. And that leads to the idea that if you make such a proof, every rational being, every rational being is capable of understanding that proof and then becoming a Christian. Because if you've proven something, well, ratio dictates that you actually accept that. Now, if you do that, and you find people who deny your rational proof of God, and don't become Christians, that means they're not rational, right? And that leads to the question, like, if rationality, if ratio is the distinguishing feature of humanity, those people who are not rational, are they still very much human? <clears throat> yes, and there are uh, several theologians who actually write that argument out and dehumanize Jews in that regard. 
in a theological debate. And it's something that we'll see again and again, that the, through that kind of argument on a theological level, Jews are becoming less than human in, in that Christian theology. Third part. A lot of individual things, and we need to talk about the blood libel and the ritual murder. See, what happens is the following. We find in several places, we start in England and then it moves to France and all kinds of other places, situations where the murder of a child is blamed on a group of Jews. In this case, we need to talk about a boy named William. And once that happens, the story gets uh, told by a monk called Thomas of Monmouth. He's the guy that we actually need to talk about because William's just William in that case. P point is, he writes down that story of the death of William and how the Jews planned that and plotted that. And the story that he comes up with is that on the cemetery, <laughs> in, on a cemetery in France, <laughs> Jews meet every year to decide <laughs> that one Christian child somewhere in Christian Europe needs to be murdered as retribution for all the mistreatment the Jews have suffered from the Christians. Now, keep, keep that in mind when we come back to later ideas of meetings on cemeteries and um, conspiracies and so forth. Um, but what happens is that thing becomes a very popular narrative. And the idea that, that Jews go and murder Christian children in a ritual mocking or repeating the crucifixion of Christ um, <clears throat> becomes an ongoing narrative. It later becomes switched into all kinds of different versions of like using Christian blood, the blood of Christian children to also mock the, um, <clears throat> well, to spoil the host or stuff like that. It's what is called a blood libel. So ritual, ritual murder of Christian children. It kind of connects back to, although there's no links to actually prove that, to the story that we talked about in part one about like pre-Christian hatred of Jews um, and the story that they would um, ritually sacrifice a, a Greek. But um, here we are. It's a huge story. The, the conspiracy of Jews to take revenge on the Christians by ritually murdering a child becomes another key story in that area. Now, why is all of this so important? See, we have these individual events of hatred. We can usually find very specific political reasons on why a specific Jewish community was accused of something or other, and so forth. But these, because we have a rise in literacy and exchange of news and so forth, are then taken by that new machine, that new bureaucracy, that new form of, that legal bu bureaucracy, they are all taken and turned into a formalized definition of the Jew that needs to be persecuted to keep the body of Christ pure. The body of Christ, in this case, being Western Europe under Christianity, Christendom, as some people might call it. And that's, that's the really important key here, that we have all of that becoming one ongoing narrative of the Jew. The idea here, the term here is the hermeneutical Jew, because it does not have anything to do with like actual people living on the ground, of Jewish faith or anything like that. It's a it's an image that is persecuted and people will be persecuted by that. The other part that is important here, and that's um, the Fourth Lateran Council at 1215, where we have a very specific law that means Jews have to wear a piece of cloth on their clothing to mark them as Jews, because there is, with the lack of, you know, that tribal identification and new forms of, like, who belongs to a state and who doesn't, there's that fear of pollution, and there's that fear that people might not recognize a Jew or a Jewess. <clears throat> Literally, there's a sexual component, the fear that Christian men might lie with Jewish women, or the other way around, but usually it's men lying with Jewish women and not knowing about it, and thus polluting themselves and so forth. And to combat that, we there is the idea of wearing cloth marks to become, you know, recognizable and be visibly othered. The same happens in a way to, you know, lepers who are sent into leprosaria outside of towns and so forth, but mostly this is about Jews. And there is, there's, you know, that polluting language going on that does connect Jews with heretics and lepers when you look in, into the text as well. <clears throat> so once uh, heresy and leprosy go down, it's the Jews that remain in that, in that regard. Also at that time, we find um, a rise in, you know, 
caricatures, images of Jews with those very specific physical, um, recognizable, exaggerated physical um, marks, you know, the, the huge nose, all of these elements that we know from all these Nazi caricatures, they show up in the 12th and 13th century as well, because they're another way to mark Jews as un like inhuman, as less than human, and as very specific to, to recognize them as other from that new form of identification or that new form of identity that we have at the time. And all of that, well, comes to a head once again during the plague in the 14th century, because we don't have any heretics left. We have very few lepers left. So who's actually to blame for like actual sickness and illness coming over the body of Christ. Well, that one pollution that we still know is there, which is Jews, and they get expelled from all kinds of towns or massacred just as they got before during the Crusades, when we have people also ridding the body of Christ, that being Christendom in this case, from um, impurities, which, you know, are Jews. And that's, that's the key that we need to take away from this part of the Middle Ages. The way that the rise of society, or the growth of society in all kinds of ways, the rise of education, lead to a class that is reliant on an ongoing group of people that they can persecute to demonstrate their usefulness to their lords. And in that result, they systematize and they formalize and they legalize an image of the Jew that needs to be persecuted. And that image, because of its deep rootedness in laws, in church laws, in phys secular laws, makes it very deep into our imagination at the time, into our minds. And then we come to the early modern times. What happens there is what we'll find out next. Part four, from Reformation to Revolution, the early modern age. Now it is time to look at um, the next sort of chapter in our ongoing story here, that being roughly the time from the mid of the 15th century to the end of the 18th century, so sort of 300 years, give or take a bit. And I'm facing one of those big problems that I've been facing throughout this entire video, which is which parts to pick, which parts not to pick. And one of these things that we encounter, the closer we get to our own current time, is that um, we have way more sources. And that allows us to talk way more detailed about stuff. That gives us way more nuance. And we're encountering this, like, you know, I talked about a thousand years in the last part, and now we're 300 years. That will continue as we move on. I'm also facing another problem here, and that is there are several things going on during the period that I'm talking about that um, are only tenuously connected. I'm trying to um, talk about all of these disparate elements to, uh, you know, get them to make sense, which is what I'll try to do. The overarching theme is the Christian lens of the early modern age. Uh, but I'll start with politics, and then we move into theology. See, during the 15th century, um, Europe becomes way more Christian than it was before, and these kind of borders sort of solidify in a way that have had a huge impact on how we see the world, even today. And there's a bunch of, uh, you know, dates that are important for that. 1453, the Ottomans finally conquer Constantinople, and the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, completely falls. Now, that has a lot of, um, a huge impact on a lot of different areas. First of all, the Eastern Roman Church, the Orthodox Church, loses a lot of status in that situation. And that's important because during the Middle Ages, the great schism between Western and Eastern um, Catholicism, well, Western and Eastern Christianity, is one of the main conflicts that is happening. Now, that one kind of falls to the wayside because in Western Europe, suddenly no one really cares about Eastern um, Orthodoxy um, anymore. It also leads to a lot of, you know, movement. Christians are fleeing from Constantinople and, like, the Byzantine Empire, the rest of the Byzantine Empire, landing mostly in Italy. Um, 
Jews are fleeing, some Jews are fleeing or moving from uh, Constantinople to Italy, and all of that leads, of course, to a lot of interactions with scholars in the West, um, or, well, in Italy and other parts of Western Europe, and all of that, you know, moves on to become the Renaissance. A lot of ideas um, looking back at, well, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, well, the Greek classics and so forth, and also having interactions about Judaism, uh, Christians starting to learn Hebrew you know, Hebraic, to actually read the Old Testament or, like, sources in that language and so forth. So that's kind of good, isn't it? But there's more happening. See, 1492, <laughs> the fall of Granada, marks the end of Muslim kingdoms in Spain and Portugal. It's the end of the, uh, of the Andaluth. And um, from that point onwards... All of Western Europe is completely Christian. See, that's something that we often forget. It's like during, or is considered the Middle Ages. Parts of the Iberian uh, Peninsula are um, under Muslim rule, so to speak. And um, yeah, with 1492, that is no longer the case. So all of Western Europe is now finally Christian, except for the Jews. Now, throughout history, we've always had individual expulsions of Jews from all kinds of kingdoms, uh, cities, that kind of stuff is going on forever. But, and I've mostly ignored it because it usually has very specific um, political reasons why that happened. And if we, you know, look at all the atrocities committed against Jews in Western Europe, we'd be here for hours and hours and hours per century. Um, so we're not doing that, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, however, what happens in 1492, slightly after the fall of Granada, is the Edict of Alhambra, the Alhambra Decree. And what happened there is that um, Queen Isabella and Queen Ferdinand, the most Catholic royals at the time, um, expel all Jews from, the, from Spain. In 1497, they are also expelled from Portugal. And there's a bunch of things happening at the time. See, they allow Jews to convert to Christianity. And if they convert to Christianity, they are allowed to stay in Spain. Some people do that. Some people have already um, had already converted to Christianity over the last century or so. And a lot of um, uh, Jews move away from Spain, move mostly to the Netherlands at the time. Amsterdam, Amsterdam being sort of the main center there. Now, why is this in particular special? <clears throat> well, for one, Jews used to live in Spain and Portugal long before <laughs> Christianity was a thing, because once again, it's close to um, North Africa, the Levant, and other areas where Jews lived in pre-Christian uh, times. <clears throat> so those Jews kicked out of Spain had been there before the Christians even showed up before, and uh, that makes a huge difference. It's also a very large Jewish community, the Sephardic community there. So that's one important element. There's another element here. And uh, that is something that will become really problematic. See, those Jews who converted to Christianity are then called conversors or new Christians versus the old Christians. And you can see where this is going, right? <clears throat> see, what happens is, of course, um, that um, these new Christians um, still, you know, work very profitably in Spain and in Portugal, occupy positions of power, and that does not exactly, um, you know, vibe with the old Christians. Which leads to something really important, and that is the uh, discrimination against new Christians. Now, why is that important? Because it does <laughs> change from anti-Judaism in a religious sense to a racial sense. It's like, you're not a proper Christian. You're still a Jew underneath. There is a term crypto-Jew that is bandied about, and... Um, the accusation that Jews are, in fact, still, you know, observing Jewish, uh, Judaist rites and just pretending to be Christians. So we learn, we, we start to have rules, laws that prevent new Christians from occupying positions in authority, becoming priests, becoming um, local magistrates and so forth. The so-called um, laws of purity of blood. And if that... It doesn't make you cringe. 
or get worried, then I don't know what should, because, you know, that's really bad. <clears throat> so we have a first shift to a form of racism. Well, the organization in control of that and observing of that is the Spanish Inquisition, which is somewhat different from the medieval Inquisition. We're not going there, but let's just say they burn people in auto da fe's, which, yeah, is bad. <clears throat> we'll come back to that, but first let's move to the migration. So we have a lot of um, Jews um, migrating to Northern Europe, mostly, um, um, as I said, some, some are moving to uh, England, which is slowly allowing them back in, but very carefully. They're officially not allowed there, but as new Christians, they can go there. A lot of them are actually moving to the Netherlands, which is accepting them in Amsterdam. They are still keeping their trade networks going because they obviously still have family members or friends, people of their communities who stayed in Spain as new Christians, uh, people that moved to other parts of Europe as part of those migrations, those forced migrations, let's keep not forget that. And um, they are building up, at least parts of them are building up trade networks and are profiting uh, from that. There has ever, ever been another migration at the same time, and that is from Germany further east. See, for a long time there has been that trend for um, uh, local uh, royalty, local aristocracy to use Jews uh, when they open up new lands. They conquer a place um, that is not yet very developed and they allow Jews to settle there and develop that land because, as we spoke about before, a lot of um, Jews are literate at the time, they have connections that can be used and so forth. So you send, they send these people there to exploit the land. Jews are still occupying that position in between. And that leads, <clears throat> on the one hand, <laughs> to um, them being hated as exploit exploiters, even though they're just the tools of the actual, like, ruling class. It also leads, with that whole m migration, to a lot of poverty. See, as I said, there's forced migration further east, and there's first a forced migration off <clears throat> the Iberian Peninsula, and migration comes with loss of status, comes with loss of means, and comes with a lot of poverty. So, at the same time, we're having both these stereotypes that will come back on a political and racist um, level, moving on an economic level, the stereotype of the rich, <laughs> exploiting Jew and traitor, and the stereotype of the poor, dirty, beggar, vagabond, um, the spreader of disease, and so forth. Now, we've heard all of these before, but they are rooted in here, and that's something that will come back again. The seeming inconsistency in contemporary um, or modern anti-Semitism, accusing Jews both of being very rich and being very poor and dirty at the same time, it's, it's something that will come back again and again, and it, you can find it here in the fact that victims of persecution and forced migration tend towards poverty, and those who were already very well off and rich and privileged before that migration can, obviously, use those uh, connections afterwards to remain in some form of power, which then, <laughs> in, in a fragile form of power, which brings us to the next bit, and that's the, um, the court Jewish problem. See, <laughs> European royalty it's expensive. They, they need a lot of money, and they need people to lend them that money. There are Christian banks at that time, don't worry, and that's not where this goes. But Western European Christian royalty is not in the habit of actually paying back their loans, which makes a lot of Christian banks very, or individuals, very careful when it comes to um, <laughs> lending them money. However, Jews, because of their more precarious situation politically, ethnically, and so forth, have less of a choice, um, which leads to the situation that a lot of Western Christian royalty and aristocracy borrows large amounts of money from Jews who um, have very little choice in the matter, but that still obviously connects Jews with, as financiers, with financiers, with uh, the aristocracy and royalty and the ruling class in the mind of other people. And now we come to a situation where all of that ties together and that is Machiavelli. If you excuse me that um, quick excursus, we need to talk about Machiavelli for a, se a second here. 
So, Niccolo Machiavelli publishes, um, or at least writes, The Prince in the early beginnings of the 16th century. Il Principe, fantastic book, you should go and read it. Um, and it gets immediately <laughs> misrepresented by a lot of people. Really hate it. And that misrepresentation uh, representation is still around today. Unless you actually have read Machiavelli, I'm like 90% sure you have a very wrong image of what is actually in that book. But let that be as it may. The situation is that Machiavelli and the Machiavel, and the term Machiavellian, become a trope and a stereotype almost immediately in a lot of parts of Europe, especially in the English-speaking language uh, country, but also in France and other places. And that stereotype is, well, the one that is still around, of Machiavelli proposing or being a guide for people to become ruthless, conspirators, pretending to be one thing while in truth being something else, deceiving everyone for the need of wealth and power, just for the gain of wealth and power. That's, that's the image. And that image immediately gets connected to something else. <laughs> Satanism and Satan. <laughs> See, I said before, this is a Christian lens. And a lot of the early enemies or early detractors of Machiavelli are actually priests, are actually bishops and other uh, cler uh, clerics. And they use Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call him, uh, the Antichrist, as like an argumentative tool. They don't like Machiavelli. He has to be using, you know, working for Satan, which is one part that we see here. And then we see another part, and that is, once again, when we return to um, the uh, situation in Spain, <clears throat> that is, we have a large group of people, or a, not large, but we have a group of people that is sort of in power and is already under the suspicion, the racist suspicion of pretending to be Christians while they're in truth something else. Yeah, <clears throat> it doesn't take, a lo take long to connect those dots. <clears throat> which is exactly where we need to go with quick representations here. See, you probably heard about Shylock, the Merchant of Venice, um, Shakespeare, a very popular, well, probably one of the most well-known representations of a Jewish caricature in, well, early modern literature. But that one's not very accurate. It's very much a stereotype of medi a connection of medieval stereotypes. Another one, however, at the same time is the Jew of Malta, Barabbas. <clears throat> this one's written by Christopher Marlowe, who is far superior in a lot of other ways as well. And the Jew of Malta, Barabbas, while having some connections to an actual living um, person, um, does also have Machiavelli show up in the prologue talking about these plans of Machiavellianism and mentioning the devil. So there you have that connection of Jews with Machiavelli and conspiracies and Satan. And that will, you know, stay with us for a long while. Now, <clears throat> we have another example from 1660. There is a Spanish text called um, The Hour of Every Man, Hora de Toros, uh, Hora de Toros, or something like that. I'm sorry for the mispronunciation. But it describes the meeting of a lot of politicians and Jewish merchants in Ottoman Salonika, planning to take over the world or take over the country with a very capitalist interpretation of Judaism. That's in that text. Now, does that sound familiar to you? I bet it does. <clears throat> so, where are we going with this? Why did I mention this? <clears throat> One thing that we've seen before is how um, certain groups are othered and discriminated against. In the Middle Ages, those were lepers, heretics, and so forth, and Jews. And this time around, it's well, still Jews, it's Machiavelli and people following a very specific kind of politics that Machiavelli actually supported and other people that are, you know, branded with that. And every time... What happens at the end is that all these new aspects, whether it's be the connection with um, disease and lepers or the connection with the devil and the antichrist in um, heretics or in this time round the idea of um, being deceitful and um, conspirators with Machiavelli, these are slowly folded into that construction of the Jew that is hated and discriminated against and persecuted.
However, I said the Christian lens, and we need to look at that as well <clears throat> to get a full picture of what happened. The Reformation. See, at the beginning of the 15th century, the 16th century, Europe is completely Christian. We talked about that. That means everything happening in Europe is seen through that Christian lens and Christian interpretation. It also means that Christianity has the time and chance and opportunity to deal with itself, to look inwards, to um, start uh, looking at reformations and criticisms and so forth. Now, they have happened before. There's Wycliffe in England, there's Hus and the Hussites in um, Bohemia, but the big one is Martin Luther in Germany, of course. Um, there's also, obviously, John Calvin in Geneva, and we need to, well, we're not going to talk much about Calvin because it's way more about theology with him. However, what happens in Reformation, early Reformation, is something um, that is a key for what happens in the future. Reformers at the time cast themselves in the role of Jesus and his disciples in the fight against Second Temple Judaism. Second Temple Judaism, as we spoke about before, is described as full of rules, uh, legalistic, and so forth, which of these reformers then use this construction of Second Temple Judaism, that is, uh, they use or Judaism in general, they use and um, to attack the Catholic Church, which is then described as basically the same thing. So our reformers pretend to, to be or claim to be the spiritual successors of Jesus, whereas the Catholic Church is the spiritual successor of Second Temple Judaism or Judaism in general. That doesn't make any sense historically or any other way, but it allows those um, uh, reformers to dip into that large pool of resentments and stereotypes um, against Jews and just use them there. They are using anti-Semitism, or in this case anti-Judaism, and other stereotypes as a tool. They're using Jews and Judaism as a tool. They're objectifying it for other means. They're transferring it to a different discussion. They talk about the Catholic Church being Judaizers and so forth. <clears throat> While at the same time trying to convert the Jews. See that part? They still keep. <clears throat> Jews need to convert. Now the argument is well, of course they didn't convert to Catholicism because, you know, Catholicism is just the same thing they had already. But now that we have our reformed Christianity, well, obviously the Jews will finally recognize Jesus Christ as the Messiah and regret their, uh, well, missing the point back in the day and convert to reformed Christianity, or so Luther hoped. Didn't happen, obviously, understandably. And Judah and Luther got mad, like real mad. Luther started by, by well, becoming really anti-Jewish in both the ethnic and the religious way. He wrote, uh, wrote a text called On the Jews and Their Lies, which just collects all the stereotypes, all the terrible things we've talked about before, and it is written in German, in the German language. Luther famously wrote in German, which ties into the rising of a German, well, not yet national sentiment, but at least the idea that German-speaking countries are somewhat connected in some way. And Jews are obviously not a part of that. They build, they're outside of that. Or so, Luther starts to claim. That part state with the um, Protestant, the Lutheran Church, almost until today, or at least until the 30s and 40s, but um, we'll keep it at that for now. However, what happens now with the um, Reformation becoming successful, both in the Calvinist way in the Americas and England, which is less overtly anti-Semitic and tries to more, you know, work down the idea of converting the Jews um, to uh, bring about rapture. Um, we'll talk about that in the future. Um, but <clears throat> it becomes popular. That means Christianity is no longer monolithic in Western discourse. And the next logical step is the all-out attack on 
Christianity and religion, which goes hand in hand with one other um, effect of the times that we're talking about, the 14th, well, mostly the 15th and 16th and 17th century, and that is the beginning of the Enlightenment, the rise of the scientific uh, method with authors like Francis Bacon and, uh, well, Newton, Descartes, so forth. The idea that dogmatic Christianity, whatever way, is maybe not the be all and end all. The Enlightenment starts to attack Christianity on all kinds of counts. And there's basically two ways. One of them is to attack Judaism, because if you see Judaism as the foundation for Christianity, if you kick it away the foundation as um, Judaism, that will also destroy the edifice above that. The major proponent of that approach is one Frenchman called Voltaire, you've heard about him before, um, who is very, very anti-Judaist uh, in a lot of ways and does not uh, shrink back from also attacking Jews as um, an ethnicity. The other approach is, well, more like looking at the Old Testament um, as historiography and trying to secularize it, which is the approach people like John Toland and, uh, in some regard, John Locke took, which is casting Moses as a lawgiver, like like Herger's in, and, and Solon in Greek history, and uh, Moses using the superstition of his contemporaries uh, to actually use his secular, you know, get his secular laws accepted. That's uh, another cast there. Now, why is that also important? It means that, according to this school of thought. Jews should also abandon their laws and rules that go beyond the eminently sensible parts of Moses' law. All the religious laws, the circumcision, all of these elements, they should abandon those and become secular, um, accepting of a one creator God with those deist um, principles um, of behavior attached. That leads together with the idea of Christian approaches, to casting Judaism as historic, as far away, as old, as ancient, and probably uh, not up to snuff, so to speak. All of these different approaches lead into um, the, uh, well, the age of secularity. See, the Christian lens, the Christian lens has been broken, and society is, well, we look at the world through the lens of science, of academia, except for those people who remain staunchly Christian. And from that point onwards into modernity, we have some people firmly believing in Judaism as a religion, as being wrong, connected to the devil, and so forth. And we have people who see Judaism as just one other religion that is, well, people's private matter, but we still need to deal with all these people that are ethnically or religiously Jews. We need to find out how they can be integrated into societies. In, well, we need to ask the Jewish question. And we'll go there in the next part when we talk about the 19th century. Part 5. The Age of Anti-Semitism. We are nearing the end of our um, two millennia journey through... Um, Jewish suffering, the persecution of Jews, lies and rumors told about Jews, and all of that, um, to come back to our actual goal, and that um, last part is the 19th century, mostly, and how all of these uh, stories that I've been telling you before kind of come back together into what is actually anti-Semitism in the proper term. And for that, I'll go through um, three European countries from the end of the 18th century to somewhere in the beginning of the 20th century and uh, tell you how out of anti-Judaism and hatred for Jews and all kinds of other things, mostly the fight for modernity or against modernity, our modern anti-Semitism grew and uh, changed the world forever, unfortunately. So, let's start with the Jewish question. Nowadays, that is obviously a dog whistle, not even a dog whistle, like a, a code for um, anti-Semites. But when it actually was posed for the first time back in the 18th century, 
or called the Jewish question, it was quite different. See, um, uh, when I mentioned that the um, early modern age was a time where Europe was completely Christianized and everything was seen through a Christian lens, that obviously ends near the 18th, end of the 18th century uh, during the, or as an effect of, the Age of Enlightenment. And that means that certain things need to be um, answered differently. That being, religion is no longer a defining quality necessarily. Instead, we are coming up with all kinds of other definitions of nationality or um, citizenship and so forth. And that raises the question, what to do with Jews living all across these countries? That is the Jewish question. And, well, mostly the idea is like, how can we make them citizens in our new forming nations and give them the same rights that everyone else has and the same duties? Can we trust them? So forth and so forth. They are not the only group that is, um, you know, faced with that situation. In England, for example, Catholics um, certainly have uh, are seen which much more skeptical than Jews during the 19th century. Um, but it is a question that is asked in all kinds of places. Now, there is a famous German text about that by someone called Dom, posed a Prussian officer posed in the 18th century, and the idea there is that, yes, well, if we integrate uh, Jews into our nation, give them the same duties and so forth, they will slowly integrate, leave behind their um, weird religion, and become just as German as everyone else. There's other people that say that, that will never happen, but that's where the discussion kind of starts. Then the French Revolution happens, and does actually, well, do the thing. After some debates in 1791, the um, uh, French integrate or naturalize all Jews in their territory. All Jews become French citizens with the same rights and duties as everyone else. And that's pretty cool. And uh, the lucky thing is that once Napoleon takes over, these um, rights are extended to every part of Napoleon's empire, at least for as long as Napoleon stays there. However, there's other discussions, as I said, in Germany and other parts of um, Europe about the same question, which leads us to the actual 19th century, things that happened there, and we'll go through three European countries that are important for that part, that being Germany, France, and Russia. And the great conflict during the 19th century is the fight between tradition and con uh, or conservatism on the one side and modernity or progressivism on the other side. Now, if you're already starting to think in contemporary um, modern political terms, um, put that aside for, for a moment. I mean something different here, or at least something that is not the same. <clears throat> so let's start with Germany. Germany, at the beginning of the 19th century, is not yet one country. Germany in Europe is pretty late when it comes to <laughs> becoming one nation, the German nation. Um, Italy is slightly later still, but, you know, we're sticking with Germany for the sake of simplicity here. So Germany is still divided into all kinds of parts. There's the Prussian Empire, there is the Habsburg Empire with Austria and so forth. There's all kinds of places still. But there is a growing sense, a growing movement of German identity, German national identity, that um, culminates in the so-called revolution of 1848. Um, <laughs> that does not actually go far, because, you know, Germans and revolution don't work so well, but it does certainly um, culminate w with that... Um, moment of Germany maybe almost becoming a democracy, almost becoming modern, and becoming one nation. However, the question is still like, what's the German nationality? What's the German national identity? And it is no longer framed in these Christian terms that we had before. It is, however, um, framed in more... Um, racist terms, because race science is one of the many sciences that are suddenly used to define things. And the question is like, what's the German identity? Um, 
It is pre-Christian, it is pastoral, it is, um, the German word for it is folkish in a lot of ways. Um, it is tied to the um, uh, German Romantic movement, to um, um, images of the Middle Ages or early Middle Ages that are not necessarily close to the truth, but that's sort of what you have there. And in that regard, it is violently anti-modern and anti-urban. See, the 19th century is, of course, the century of industrialization, and Germany goes through a very rapid and organized and structured industrialization that leaves a lot of people, especially in the rural areas, small-time artisans and so forth, um, on the losing end of social changes. And they are very much receptive to these ideas of a German pastoral romanticized identity. And, at the same time, they need someone to blame for these elements that they perceive as modernity and industrialization, the rise of um, capital, um, uh, capitalist finance economy, those kind of things. And as it turns out, since we are in the time where um, Jews are slowly being integrated and getting more and more rights, they become identified with that movement or that change in a way. Which, you know, we can, um, Germans can fall back onto stereotypes about that connect Jews with money le lending and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's sort of where these connections come from. And um, they culminate in, well, two things. One of them, um, well, the main thing being the bank crash of 1873, in which one or two Jewish-owned bank houses are involved next to a lot of other bank houses, banking houses that are not Jewish-owned, and a lot of people lose a lot of money, including some Jews, quite a lot of Jews as well. But th that is certainly um, one of the flashpoints for very explicit anti-Semitism anti in Germany, or the hatred of Jews in Germany, and the connection with international finance and banking. <clears throat> So that, all of that ties together and the German view of anti-Semitism that becomes political anti-Semitism for the first time connects Jews with international finance, global and urban life, globalism, internationalism, urban lifestyle, that is connected with Jews in a German idea. And it's, you know, it starts becoming more conspiratorial. And for that, we need to look at fiction. There is a German author called Goethe, and Goethe, after being fired for um, forging some documents in, in the 19th century, becomes a novelist, and he writes a three-volume novel that no one really reads. It's called Biarritz. And in Biarritz, there's one scene in which um, the elders, or, or one rabbi for each of the 12 uh, tribes of Israel, meets on the Prague Cemetery to plan um, the downfall of um, humanity and the taking over or making the next century a Jewish century. It's, as I said, it's fiction, it's really cheesy to read, but that scene out of a three-volume novel that no one ever reads becomes, you know, take, is, is taken out, is slightly reformulated and spread as non-fiction. Um, it's called The Rabbi's Speech. We will hear more of it later, but a large part of that conversation is very much about taking control of banking, indus industry, finance, and so forth to control the world. So, the German contribution to anti-Semitism, apart from a lot of things, is the connection or the identification of mod modernism, modernity, industry, and capitalism, and finance, and banking with Jews, which become synonyms and dog whistles nowadays. There is another thing that Germany does, and that is invent the term anti-Semitism. It's um, <laughs> Christian first, William William uh, Wilhelm Marr, who does that in 1879 when he forms the, um, well, the Anti-Semitic League. And we need to talk about that term anti-Semitism for a second. See, we had Jew hatred before, we had um, anti-Judaism before. Anti-Semitism is a new term deliberately chosen to signal a change in approach. 
While hating Jews was always a, a localized thing or a special thing for one specific reason, a religion in anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism is choosing this term, which sounds more scientific because we're in the scientific age, and to universalize and generalize the opposition to um, Jews in all kinds of ways, in a scientific, modern way, a general way. That's, that's part of the thing that is important here. We'll come back to that later, don't worry. So that's where German anti-Semitism starts. It becomes popular really quickly as a political movement, political platform. People start anti-Semitic clubs, anti-Semitic newspapers. People run for parliament. Now, the Germany actually has a parliament and is an actual country. In the 1870s and 1880s, 1880s people run on anti-Semitic platforms and they're proud anti-Semites to um, move onwards there. In fact, from that anti-Semitic perspective, it's no longer about religion, it's about like a specific identity, a heritage, an ethnicity, a race um, that is in opposition to the German, it's already sometimes called Aryan, but mostly called German at the time, um, race or German identity. And that duality is built up in that anti-Semitic mind. Obviously, it's important to understand that um, it is not necessarily actually a politically successful pre-First um, World War, but it is a, a constant lower background noise of German politics is people being openly anti-Semitic and calling themselves anti-Semites. However, this is not the only country where things like that happen at that time, and it's the point where we go back to France. Now, France is a bit of a different story. See, France has its key historical moment in 1789 with the French Revolution. And a lot of um, events happening in the 19th century are France trying to come to terms with the events of the French Revolution, of the um, Napoleonic Empire, the return of the democracy of the next republic, the um, uh, other Napoleons, the, um, and so forth. That's, that's a lot of things that happen in France. And more or less broadly, the revolution and the republic is seen as modernity and as progress, whereas um, monarchy is obviously seen as traditional and conservative in a lot of ways. And that, that is where the uh, Jews fit in in French discourse in the 19th century. But they are introduced slowly. So we need to start with Abbé Barwell and a long text that he wrote about the French Revolution and who is to blame for it. Turns out it's the Freemasons, supported by the Illuminati, who are both fronts for the Templars. If you remember, the, the Order of the Templars, that Crusading Knights Order, was uh, disbanded, to put it very mildly, well, taken apart by the French monarchy, with their last grandmaster, Jacques de Molay, being um, executed, well, burned. And um, the idea is now that, actually, they just went into the underground and they, well, built Freemasonry and the Illuminati as France to destroy France and take revenge. And that's apparently what happened, according to Abbé Bowell. Now... Bowell doesn't mention the Jews in that one, but a letter by one Simonini, who is apparently, well, didn't exist. It's a forgery by uh, royalist parts of the French um, uh, society that uh, wanted to prevent Napoleon from giving further rights to Jews. But anyway, that letter connects all of these fronts to the Jews, claiming that the Jews are actually the ones behind the Templars. They are also behind, well, all kinds of other evils, um, both um, the old man of the mountain, uh, the leader of the assassin sect, and Mani, the creator of the Manichaean sect, are apparently also Jews, according to this letter. It's a weird thing, It's, um, but it's real. Like, it exists, it's a forgery, it exists, it was published in 1806, connecting all of these things with the Jews. And that leads us to the French contribution. The French contribution being the Judeo-Masonic conspiracy. See, we've spoken about how all kinds of different negative things, signs of modernity and so forth, um, are usually demonized and othered over history, and then are slowly folded into um, the hatred of Jews, and are slowly identified with, uh, with Jews. 
And it's very quickly that this happens with the Freemasons and the Jews. The Freemasons are seen as drivers of modernity because it was fairly progressive at the time. <clears throat> so, of course, they're actually just a front for the Jews, according to this conspiracy. And it gets popular really fast. However, there's more. And that is, well, Machiavelli, our good friend. We're now talking about the age of Napoleon III, who made himself emperor and <laughs> dictator, basically, through means of democracy. And there is a text written by Maurice Joly that talks about all of that as a dialogue between Machiavelli and Montesquieu in hell, where Machiavelli is clearly <laughs> explaining his plot to take over the world um, by describing all the things that Napoleon III had already done, plus some of the things that he will probably most likely do in the near future. It's a satire, it's brilliant, it's a lot of fun, <laughs> and it gets uh, Maurice Joly into prison as soon as the book is written, because Napoleon III is not exactly a fan of that, uh, nor is his secret police. So most people just forget that thing. But it's important to keep that in mind for something that happens later. So where Germany has the main conflict between tradition and modernity as between a rural and urban society, between a pastoral agrarian society and a industrialized society, in France it's more between a progressive republican and a very Catholic um, royalist society. And that conflict is obviously um, boils over in the event of the Dreyfus affair, where um, people forge documents, blame um, a Jewish um, officer, uh, Dreyfus, um, Alfred Dreyfus, uh, for, as a spy, uh, sending documents to the Germans, even though it's a different one. It's, it's a whole mess. And I can't go into details here, but that's exactly where you have that conflict breaking out between French royalist traditionalists on the one hand and very progressive republicans on the other hand um, and using the um, anti-Semitic elements here as something, as a tool to fight over. That's, that's an important element here. It's no longer Jews are blamed for something, but Jews and the hatred of Jews is now used as a tool to demonize other things in society that are, um, you know, the problem is like, we're not fighting about being progressive or conservative, we're fighting about the Jews who are to blame for this. That's the French contribution. Now let's look at Russia and how all of this comes together. Russia is a very special case in a lot of situations. The Russia is very slow when it comes to modernizing. Russia is um, still a very feudal aristocracy um, monarchy all the way back. The Tsar is still very much an absolutist ruler in a lot of ways, and it's much more of an agrarian society than Germany or any other part of Europe at the time. It is far away from any form of modern economy um, in a lot of ways, but during the 19th century, these things slowly change. Now, what happens here is, is, is the religious element. See, <clears throat> for a lot of in, in, in a, a lot of parts of Russian philosophy or like worldview at the time, that system, the feudal system, with a lot of uneducated, <clears throat> downtrodden peasants out there uh, being um, exploited and so forth, uh, is seen as not only as God-given but also as the perfect society for Russia. It's the <clears throat> Elevating the peasantry, elevating the poorer parts of society, educating them and so forth, is seen as dangerous because it will actually it goes against their nature. <clears throat> that is all tied in with the Orthodox Russian Orthodox Church and the the Emperor, the Tsar, um, being connected to all of that. Russian Orthodoxy is rather mystically leaning at the time. <clears throat> There's a lot of obscure, almost occult elements in it um, that are, you know, on that one side. But during the second half, or like the later end of the 19th century, Russia is more or less forcefully, um, well, industrialized or, you know, has to adopt elements of a capitalist society, including the dreaded gold standard, which is a, an irony that um, introducing the gold standard is seen as a Jewish plot to destroy, <laughs> destroy Russia by inventing capitalism, which inevitably will lead to socialism and so forth, according to propaganda at the time. 
Now, why am I explaining all of this? See, <clears throat> there is terrorism and building unrest in Russia during the latter half of the 19th century. And a lot of that, sooner or later, becomes blamed, is blamed on Jews. Now, Jews are obviously involved there, just like everyone else, um, but it's mostly... Um, well, they're just part of it because they're Russian citizens. As much as uh, Jews are allowed to be Russian citizens, which is not that much, because there's very heavy restrictions on Jews in Russia all the way to the second half of the 19th century. Their, their integration and naturalization takes even longer than in Germany. But they are a welcome tool, which leads us to the thing that you knew would be coming. Well, on the one hand, we have um, that fight between like hardcore right-wing conservatives that are following the Tsar and um, rebellious groups, um, social Democrat, Democrats, actual Democrats, and so forth, that will all lead into the Russian Revolution at some point in the future. But so far, we just have like, you know, attacks on Tsars, and then we have pogroms, a lot of pogroms, where people just riot and destroy property in the 1880s, or start killing and abusing Jews um, in, the early 19th, in the early 20th century. However, this is also the time where a lot of, you know, books are written about the end of days, which is obviously because we're in a religious framework still in Russia, the coming of the Antichrist, and so forth. And one person in that regard is Sergei Nilos. You knew we'd have to go there who publishes The Great and the Small, The Coming of Antichrist, which does include a lot of stuff about the Antichrist coming, using his allies, the Jews, to destroy things. It includes the protocols of the elders of Zion. <clears throat> yeah, we had to go there, which is a collection of things taken from <laughs> the dialogue between Machiavelli and Montesquieu in hell and other elements. It also sometimes includes the rabbi's speech, which was taken from Biarritz. See, it, it all comes together and it frames, on the one hand, the machinations of the Jews as, well, controlling the world by all kinds of economic and uh, policies, but also through very specific, ritualistic, Satanist, occult things. And that, that is the great element that we need to have in, keep in mind here. Um, because Russia is reinforcing the old medieval um, element, the conspiracy element that connects Jews with Antichrist, Antichrist, the devil, in a mystical sense, the magic, all the magic, the ritual murder, the blood libel, all of these things are there in the Russian conversation. And they're just used to, um, as a tool to discredit, well, <coughs> democratic forces at the time. Because as we know, <laughs> those, those documents, the protocols of the elders of Zion. They're a forgery created by elements of the, of the Tsarist um, uh, secret society, secret police, the Okhrana, to discredit uh, Jews and use them as a scapegoat to um, discredit um, the rising democratic forces. But they appeal to that part of it. So what we have, what Russia brings to modern anti-Semitism is to keep alive the older magical, mystical, occult connection between Jews and Satan. In a very sincere way, you have to understand there's a lot of people who actively believe that. <clears throat> and that's where we end up. Because after the, after the uh, Russian Revolution, a lot of the um, conservative Russian people flee to Germany, where they introduce the protocols. And the protocols are introduced to England, and they're introduced to the United States, where they are promoted by none other than Henry Ford in the Dearborn International, <laughs> and his book, um, the, yeah, the International Jew, and so forth, spreading all of these elements of the great anti-Semitic world conspiracy all over the world. And this is where we need to go for the end of this section. Because see, we, we've been talking about 2,000 years of lies about Jews. And all of these are connected 
in this final document, it's not the final document, but like this very specific successful document, it is very open, it connects a lot of different ideas. The Machiavellian ideas are in there, <clears throat> the Satanist ideas, the ritual murder are in there, the anti-capitalist, anti-financier, anti-international, anti-globalist ideas. All of these lies and rumors are connected in this one document, and because it is so all over the place, Everyone can find in it whatever they most fear. And when this document is brought back to Germany with its already structured anti-Semitic groups and leagues, well, they take it into all kinds of places when it comes to England and to America with Henry Ford's publication engine behind it. It spreads over the entire globe and everyone finds in it whatever they want. And this brings us back to, well, the Jewish question that we started this part with. Because see, <laughs> under the Christian lens, the Jewish question had an answer, a very specific answer, which is, at the end of times, the Jews will convert to Christianity, they will recognize Christ Jesus as the Messiah, and all will be well. Rapture happens, we're good. That has been taken away. Instead, we are now in a thoroughly scientific world after the Enlightenment. And that means we have we need to find new solutions, general solutions that are applied to everyone despite their religion, which is why anti-Semitism becomes distinctly racist, <clears throat> seeing Jews as a distinct race that has specific qualities, no matter what kind of faith or religion they profess. <clears throat> that leads to the question, if Jews are completely different from everyone else, distinct, and their goal is to rule the world through all these different mechanisms, controlling the banks, having connections with black magic and so forth. They are different from humans. They are very different. They can't be integrated into any society. That's, that's, the, that's the direct conclusion if you, if you follow all these wrong, we have to say that once again, wrong ideas. <laughs> and if you then pose that question, well, you can't integrate the Jews. They can't convert to Christianity because that's no longer the end goal. Well, that only leaves one solution, and that's a very final one. And that's, that's what anti-Semitism in the 19th century brought us, and that's what the 20th century showed us in all its brutality, in all its absolute horror, in its unique horror. And that's why what happens in the 20th century with the Holocaust is still unique and different from any other genocide that we've faced so far in history. And it's all brought through 2000, 2,500 years of lies and rumors that have been universalized in a way that they can be applied to just about any group out there that we don't like, just by calling them something like Jews and using them as a tool to integrate all of these problems with the world and like a lens taking all these misconceptions these fears of the world these abstract fears and turning them onto one concrete one concrete group of people that is then to blame for everything and that's that's where we'll end our historical part so all that remains is the look at what this all has to do with literature part six the Shadow of the Past. So you may be wondering why I just spent over two hours talking to you about the history of anti-Semitism and Jew hatred, and not fantasy like I promised. Well, I had this issue that I feel a lot of the times when we talk about stuff, we're not aware where those ideas come from, where those stereotypes come from, where those narratives come from. And that's why I went back and talked about the last two and a half thousand years of persecution that Jews, uh, Jews have suffered. And looked at where all of these came from, all of these stories came from, how they made their way into our cultural subconscious, and from there into literature, because they have made their way into literature. See, there's a bunch of stories, a bunch of narratives that we have encountered over the last two hours and a bit that come up again and again. And through 
throughout that history, they have become more and more abstracted and are not just about a group of people living in the same city that you have beef with, like you had with um, in Hellenistic times. They're not even about a religion that your personal religion is in competition with, like you have in the um, early, uh, late Roman Empire and early me medieval times. They're not even about, you know, stuff that is currently, you know, um, in competition in your society. No, they are about something else. They are abstract. They have become a story that can be used for everything, by everyone. And they have been infused by a lot of, well, fictions, forgeries, inventions, and all of that. And that's what anti-Semitism has become today. It is a way to look at the world, but it is also a collection of stories that we sometimes forget started out being anti-Semitic. And that's where fantasy comes in. Because, see, these stories, these stereotypes, are no longer about actual people. They can be applied to all kinds of things. And so, they can be to fantasy, which is where we need to go now. <laughs> now, before we do that, let me reiterate something that I said before. I will give you a bunch of examples. They will be famous examples from big books that sometimes have TV shows that some of you have probably seen. These are not the only ones, but I had to pick some and I decided to pick the largest ones so the most people will, you know, recognize these ideas. So there will be spoilers here, uh, be aware of that. Um, but as I said, I've picked some of the big ones, so I assume you can handle that. The next part is, I am not accusing any authors here of being anti-Semites. I think there is a big distinction to be made between having or reproducing anti-Semitic stereotypes, often not even knowingly reproducing them, and, you no, know, being actually an anti-Semite. Anti and that's a distinction that I want to make here. I am going to assume that none of the authors um, that I will be talking about are actively, you know, promoting anti-Semitism. I am assuming that these stereotypes and these narratives made it into these books by accident, which is why, you know, I call this the shadow of the past, which is, you know, the second chapter in Lord of the Rings, where we find out that something small and golden <laughs> that, uh, that Bilbo picked up by accident has a very dark past indeed. And just like that, a lot of these elements that we'll come across in the next couple of examples have a dark past, even though they started out looking quite golden and glittering. <clears throat> and we'll start with Tolkien. Now, J.R. Tolkien is not, was not an anti-Semite. From what we know, he respected and appreciated Jews. That's what we know from his um, letters with a prospective German publisher in the late 1930s, where Tolkien reacted quite angrily when they, he was asked after his Aryan descent, or possible Jewish descent, because, you know, that was quite the thing in Germany at the time. So, he's not. However, Tolkien took examples and inspiration from our world when he created his legendarium, his world of Middle-earth. And he also picked up ideas about Jews. Now, Tolkien, being the medievalist that he was, um, possibly took his ideas from a more medieval source or a more theological source. He was also, obviously, a Catholic. Now, what does that mean? Well, I'm talking about his dwarfs. First of all, he admitted, and well, admitted, he mentioned several times in letters and an interview that he was inspired by um, Semitic language for the Dwarven language, and there is more parallels here. And from what I can tell, all of this comes more or less from a point of, you know, honor or um, respect for Jews in a lot of ways. However, the result is still the reproduction of some very unfortunate stereotypes. So let's look at that. The dwarves have had a homeland that they have been, well, thrown out of by 
possibly their own mistake, that being, you know, digging too deep, digging up the Balrog that uh, expelled them from their homeland. Since then, they have been wandering around. Other dwarfs, um, well, were sent away from their mountain, the lonely mountain Erebor, that is, um, by a dragon that was attracted by their wealth and possibly their greed. So, since then, they have been in on a sort of diaspora. They are obviously connected to gold and greed. There's a famous quote in The Hobbit where it's all about, you know, dwarves not being heroes, but being calculating folks with a knowledge about the, <laughs> the worth of money and so forth. So yeah, there is that connection in there. There's more, however, and that is obviously they are secretive about their language, they're secretive about their runes that they don't teach to anyone, they mostly hide their women, and even deeper, when you look at the world building there, the dwarfs are not the children of Iluvatar. Well, not directly, not like elves and men. They are the creation of Aula, one of the Valar and thus are separate from the other sentient species of Middle-earth. They are apart from everyone else, and the chosen people, thus, of one specific god. Does that sound like something you see in theology, uh, or in some of the bits that we talked about earlier? Because, yeah, that's, that's sort of the thing. So they are separate and somewhat below the direct creations of Iluvatar, and that's unfortunate. Once again, there is no malice in anything that Tolkien put into these stereotypes, but a lot of these things that are associated with Jews have, over the process of history, led to persecution and um, discrimination against Jews. So that's the shadow of the past in Tolkien's work. However, there's obviously more. A quick one here. Because we didn't talk too much about it because of technical issues, obviously, I couldn't show you a lot of pictures. But, as I mentioned, there are caricatures and cartoons um, of Jews that go back a long time, all the way to the 13th century. In fact, that describe Jews and show Jews as somewhat weaker, subhuman, with exaggerated features like big noses, that kind of stuff. Any connection with gold, you know where this is going. It's going towards the goblins in Harry Potter. They run the banks. They have big noses, exaggerated noses. They are treacherous and greedy. And that's, well, that's a bunch of terrible anti-Semitic stereotypes that first showed up in the Middle Ages and were exaggerated over time. The treacherousness, for example, comes back in, say, the 16th century, as we mentioned. And all of it gets tied back in together during the 19th century. Plus, you know, as I said, the physical exaggeration, uh, physical marks of the big nose and so forth. It is pretty clear, once again, I don't think that J.K. Rowling, whatever else she may be, was deliberately saying, Oh, I hate Jews. I want to make this very clear by picking goblins as physically weak, somewhat less than human, with exaggerated noses and stuff, and make them greedy and so forth. No, there's a lot of ideas that creep in there with, you know, no one likes banks, no one likes people that take your money, that kind of stuff. It all creeps in there, but in these connections, the result is a bad one. So, we move on from there. Here's one that I've um, mentioned before in other situations, and that is Dan Simmons. Now, Dan Simmons is writing science fiction in theory, but it's very space opera, very light on the technology, and the fantastic and the science fiction are obviously interconnected, and so I want to bring that one up. In his Hyperion Cantos, with all four books, there are, well, there are Jews, but we're not talking about those Jews, we're talking about artificial intelligences. His AIs are evil, they're hiding in the background. They're controlling different sides of a conflict, and so forth, which, you know, we've heard about in the global conspiracy that we've, you know, talked about in mostly the 19th century. However, Dan Simmons also has a situation where a, an innocent Christian is ritually murdered, and his blood is taken out and then poured over him again. That's in the beginning of Rise of Endymion. And that is very much a description of well, a ritual murder. That's that's as close to blood libel as you can get without calling the people doing it or wanting you to do that. Well, Jews. 
In addition, of course, um, there is no need in the story for that to happen. It just, you know, a delight in a ritual um, murder that, uh, you know, reinforces those stereotypes and demonizes the people that want that, those being the artificial intelligences. There is obviously more. They're connected or compared to um, parasites, something that is very, very popular in anti-Semitic stereotypes, as we've mentioned before. They are, you know, taking, they are not creating, they are bankers, they're not producers, <laughs> that kind of thing. That was very popular ever since the... Um, 19th century. In Germany, in German anti-Semitism, the terminology was uh, raffen, raffendes Kapital and schaffendes Kapital, which is taking capital and working capital, creating capital. And um, yeah, the parasite thing comes from there. So you have that part with Dan Simmons. But, you know, as I said, there's more. There is, of course, The First Law. Now, The First Law is an interesting case because um, the First Law series by Joanna Crombie does feature banks. <clears throat> and over the process of this story, we learn that these banks are controlling large parts of policy because a lot of people have borrowed money. So they have debts with the banking house of Valand and Balk. And the banking house of Valentin Bulk may sometimes give you money to, you know, help out in a crisis, as they do with um, Sandbank Lakta in book two of the series before they are hanged. They may, however, in other situations, um, maybe forgive you some debts if you do something else for them or follow their wishes for policy, as you'll learn later on. And while this may still sound like regular anti-capitalist, uh, you know, rhetoric against banking, and there is certainly some truth to the fact that, you know, banks or the financial sector does, you know, influence policy, there is an additional level here. And that additional level is that the banking house of Valentin Bulk, the main banking sector, is in fact run by Baez the Magus through his associates. And that... That is where it gets dangerous. So you have one secretive person who is in secret running the banks and through the banks and blackmail, controlling entire nations to control and rule the world, or at least aiming to achieve all of, you know, world domination. And that is something that we've seen in, well, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and the Rabbi's speech. And... Um, that, once again, you know, just reproduces that structure. And I don't think Joe Abercrombie makes, did that in, you know, on purpose. I think it's very easy to go down that route. There is a structural element in here that we didn't talk about in this video, but there's reasons why this, this doesn't feel like anti-Semitism unless you realize that it, it, it very much reproduces that specific structure. And uh, now we come to the chief offender in my list of examples. And that is, of course, The Wheel of Time. <clears throat> now, once again, I don't think Robert Jordan was an anti-Semite. I don't even think he deliberately went for anti-Semitic anti stereotypes. I think these crept in, once again, as a result of, you know, being ubiquitous in our cultural heritage, our Western European cultural heritage. What do I mean? Well, <clears throat> in The Wheel of Time, we have peddlers. Peddlers are traveling salesmen traveling salesman, um, with, we, we see two of them, well, technically we get three of them, but one gets no physical description and just brings news and then moves on. But we see two of them in detail. And those two are described with um, darker skin, <laughs> large noses, which, you know, the physical attributes. Uh, m at least one of them, possibly both of them, are very sexually active or... Um, have a lot of sexual appetites. <clears throat> that is another stereotype that is tightly connected with Jews in the Middle Ages, possibly because of the idea of circumcision. We don't know exactly. Um, they are both, you know, greedy, wanting to make a lot of money. And as I said, like the traveling salesman, the peddler, 
probably selling less than stellar wares, is a notorious anti-Semitic stereotype from the 18th and 19th century, from times when uh, a lot of poor Jews were pushed out of all kinds of um, guild jobs and so forth and had to, well, travel and uh, sell whatever they could. And then they were maligned, maligned for selling low-quality stuff. That's, uh, that's an anti-Semitic stereotype, as it is. However, it gets worse, because both of these peddlers that we see in the books are, in fact, dark friends. They're part of the evil conspiracy that wants to take over the world. So, we're one level deeper already. Now, where do we go from here? <clears throat> well, <laughs> see, not only are they part of that, which is already bad, but the dark conspiracy of this world, the dark friends, the forsaken, the dark one, all of this is basically a fundamental evil, the dark one. You can call him Antichrist if you want. Although, you know, other terminology. That wants to take over the world. And for that, he has an organization of the Forsaken, a limited number of people that are now pitting different countries, different places of the world against each other to create a situation in which their lord can take over and rule the world. And they do that through, well, among other things, ritual murder <laughs> and lies and all of these things. And if that all of that sounds <laughs> like a Jewish world conspiracy connected to black magic and the Antichrist and on the lower end, well, traveling salesmen that are extremely sexually rapacious, have big noses, dark skin, lie and are greedy... And if all of that sounds terribly anti-Semitic, well, that's because it is. Once again, I don't think that Robert Jordan went out deliberately to build that. But, as I said, a lot of this has made its way over the last 2,500 years into our collective unconscious, our collective culture store of cultural knowledge, of stories, of narratives of stereotypes of tropes and part of why I went back through all of this history was to show you that it is that old where these things entered how they were ingrained in our society through the persecuting society in the 13th century the 12th and 13th century when these things were legalized inscribed in our western legal code through well adding all these further elements of Machiavellian and um, other conspiracies, Masonic conspiracies, showing up in fiction all the way back then, being, you know, the Machiavelli, uh, Machiavellian character being a trope all the way through Marlowe and Shakespeare, all the way to the 19th century, Biarritz and all of that stuff coming together in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which then were spread throughout the entire world, and because they are so open as a text, so easily to be used and subsumed for all kinds of other things, this stuff has seeped down into the place where we take our ideas for stories from. So let me go back to why this matters, by quoting Tolkien again, or referencing Tolkien again. In his essay on fairy stories, J.R. Tolkien talks about a cauldron. Well, he makes a soup analysis, and I think it's a very helpful one. I'll extend it. See, all of our stories as humans, they, they build up, and it's, it's like this huge bubbling cauldron full of ideas of stories. There's full stories in there, King Arthur's in there, the Greek mythology is in there, Norse mythology is in there. And whenever we tell stories, we, we take a big ladle and we take it out, and that's our very specific story. And um, when we create, we add stuff to that huge cauldron. We change stories. <clears throat> All of these new possibilities end up in the cauldron of storycraft, which, you know, has the additional bonus of being... <laughs> reminiscent of Welsh mythology, but here's here's where my additional point comes in. See, over the years, over the centuries, we've added stuff to that cauldron that is actually bitter or poisonous. It's bad for us. And if we're not careful, we'll just like 
scoop some out of that, some of that poisonous stuff out of the cauldron of storycraft when we create stories. And it's important for us to recognize those bad bits in the soup, in the cauldron of story, so we can take them out. And if we add to the cauldron of story, we know what not to put in. That's why we need to recognize these stereotypes, these narratives, so we can, well, beware of them and take away their poison. So the stories that we tell are better stories for it. Tastier stories, so to speak. <clears throat> this is why I think that it is important to recognize all these anti-Semitic stereotypes and tropes that I've been talking about for way too long now. So there's that. There is, of course, the other part that stories are how we as humans, you know, narrate our own lives. And fantasy stories have an impact on us as humans, in our actions. They make it easier to believe certain stories that we read in the news when we've also subconsciously, you know, put them into our brain again and again and again by reading fantasy. So they may, they will have, real-world consequences. And I, as a German, should not be the one to tell you that, yes, anti-Semitic stereotypes, whether they are explicitly anti-Semitic or just the structure of these narratives and stereotypes, can lead to really bad things, to the most terrible thing that happened in human history, for one. So we need to be aware of that. And with fantasy being a genre that is very deliberately influenced mostly by itself, we have to be extra careful to avoid these things in the future. And that is my goal here. That has been my goal here for the last two and a half hours, to tell you about these negative elements that have made their way not through our own fault, but through a lack of carefulness or a lack of understanding into a lot of our beloved, or most beloved stories out here. We need to be careful that they don't have any bad effects on us. That's what I want. Nothing more and nothing less. And if you've made it this far, thank you very, very, very much from the bottom of my heart. This has been by far the longest thing I've ever done, the most complicated thing I've ever done. I hope you've learned something from it. If you found this interesting and you know someone that might profit from watching it, please share it with them. I would appreciate that. If you have, you know, ideas, if you want to comment on this, tell me where I went wrong, tell me where I did something right, want to add stuff, please um, do so in the comments. There's a list of books that I've read on preparation for this um, down there. I can recommend all of them. If you want a fictional approach to all of this, well, there is Umberto Eco's um, <laughs> The Prague Cemetery that I made a video about recently. Go read that one. It deals with a lot of the same things, but as a really interesting and well-written novel. So there's that. If you've not subscribed, consider so, um, please. If you want to support me, there's a Patreon. I do appreciate all of these wonderful things. But mostly, I hope you took something away from this. And um, I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.